Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today I would like to discuss the chromosphere which is said to extend 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers above the photosphere. Although chromospheric lines can reach heights of 15,000 kilometers or more. The chromosphere is the site of weak emission lines which can be seen during an eclipse. These emission lines are extremely important as they are telling us something about the reactions taking place in this region of the sun. I have covered this material in detail in these papers but would like to give a small presentation on it as well. However, if you are interested in the details, do read the papers. The lesson for today is simple. The chromosphere is the site of condensation reactions in the sun. In the standard solar model, the chromosphere has a density of only 10 to the minus 12 grams per centimeter cubed. Such a density is not reasonable, of course, as we clearly see condensed matter in the chromosphere in the form of spicules. Spicules were first discovered by Father Angelo Secchi. He reported that in general, the chromosphere is poorly terminated and its external surface is garnished with fringes. It is almost always covered with little nets terminated in a point and extremely similar to hair. Spicules tend to have the same temperature along their entire length and can be observed in hydrogen alpha and other chromospheric lines such as calcium 2. Here is a figure of spicules obtained by the Big Bear Solar Observatory. This figure was obtained in hydrogen alpha. There are two types of spicules currently recognized in astrophysics. Type 1 spicules have lifetimes of 3 to 7 minutes and are about 500 kilometers in diameter. They can move in jerky fashion up and down and extend laterally while expanding. Type 2 spicules are shorter lived on the order of 10 to 150 seconds. In the standard model, spicules are considered like jets of plasma which are being ejected from the sun. The proposition is not reasonable as spicules are multidirectional in nature. They can rise to great heights, split in two, and their speed of formation can actually increase with increasing height. Such behavior is not consistent with the idea that they are being formed from ejection processes. Moreover, spicules cannot be made of gaseous plasma as their formation is not governed along magnetic field lines. They cannot be made of ionized gas for this reason and in addition, they cannot be made of metallic hydrogen. Therefore, I have proposed that spicules are actually dense hydrogen wherein the lattice maintains hydrogen molecules in molecular form as you can see in this figure. Such structures have been proposed in condensed matter physics when dealing with dense hydrogen. I have also proposed that spicules do not represent jets of gaseous plasma emitted from the sun, but rather are condensation products. Clearly these structures do not behave like plasma. Rather, they seem to exhibit a process analogous to those near critical opalescence, wherein they condense rapidly and randomly from their hydrogen rich environments. This brings us to the function of the chromosphere. In the standard model, this region of the sun propels matter upwards and can be used to heat the corona. But in the liquid metallic hydrogen model, this region is critically important in hydrogen condensation involving metal hydride reactions. In this way, hydrogen can be recaptured by the solar body. Spicules tend to lie above intergranular lanes as can be seen in this figure and it is easy to envision that they are channeling condensed hydrogen back towards the interior of the sun not acting to push matter into the corona. In the lower chromosphere emission lines from neutral atoms are plentiful but with increasing elevation lines from calcium 2 and hydrogen become increasingly strong. Menzel discovered at least 31 hydrogen Balmer emission lines in the chromosphere. But the lines from hydrogen Lyman alpha and Paskin series can also be observed. So why do we have all these emission lines? The answer comes from considering condensation reactions. First, one has to recognize that condensation reactions 
are exothermic in nature. That means that they have to give up some heat. When something condenses, heat is usually being dumped into the surrounding medium. You can think of water condensing down a blade of grass to produce dew. Heat is being dumped from the water into the blade of grass and thereby it's being removed. So if you want something to condense but do not have a readily available heat sink like a cool surface, the only way that you could achieve condensation is through the simultaneous emission of light to get rid of the heat. This could explain why there are so many emission lines in the chromosphere. Condensation reactions are occurring here and those reactions are dependent on the emission of light to reach the heat sink which is outer space. You can learn about such processes if you study the condensation reactions of silver clusters on earth for instance as was discussed in this paper. In this experimental setting there was no readily available heat sink. So if you have two silver clusters and bring them together under those conditions you will form an activated silver cluster which is larger. You then eject a single silver atom which takes away the heat from the cluster and the condensation product now has been stabilized. The lone silver atom then emits light and returns to the ground state. So now you have the emission of light and it can be linked to a condensation reaction and you have gotten rid of the heat which was associated with that condensation. In the chromosphere you are likely to have analogous condensation reactions wherein hydrogen is constantly being brought to condense hydrogen structures like spicules and then allowed to condense using either molecular hydrogen reactions, hydrogen cluster reactions or metal hydride reactions including species such as magnesium-2 and calcium-2. Each of these series of reactions involves the same idea, condensation ejection of an activated species and emission of light as the ejected species relaxes. At times the hydrogen condenses and brings along a single electron but when calcium hydride or magnesium hydride are utilized it can actually take two electrons to make calcium-2 and magnesium-2. It is also possible to use calcium-2 and magnesium-2 to capture hydrogen and deliver it along with a single electron given back the original species. I have discussed this type of reaction in this paper. Many metal hydrides have been found on the sun as you can see here. I took the time to illustrate several of these reactions for you. Relative to condensation, you can also have feudal reactions which only function to get rid of heat and further facilitate condensation as was first proposed in this paper. Hopefully we'll return to these ideas in future videos. But for now, remember, calcium-2 emission lines are very powerful in the chromosphere with increasing elevation. The likely reason is that calcium metal hydride is one of the most favored molecules for facilitating hydrogen condensation reactions as the height above the photosphere increases. If a lone proton binds to a free calcium atom, one can again get calcium-2, but now by donating a hydrogen atom to a condensed hydrogen structure. In this way, both protons and hydrogen atoms can be harvested from the solar atmosphere using metal hydride condensation reactions. So remember the lesson for today. The chromosphere has a real function. It is the site of condensation reactions. It acts to harvest hydrogen atoms and protons and bring them back onto the sun. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.